life. Thank you. Morena, and welcome to our third installment of our Kotai Tanga webinar series, Money Talks. Uh, my name is Samantha de Koning, and I'm the Head of Practice at Fairway, and with me are Rachel Dewar and Denise Evans. Morena, how is everybody today? Can you all hear me? Morena, Samantha, and um, Rachel, uh, nga te rauro, nga tōku rāro, rauro, ka ora e te ewi. I'm very good. I am the bustling metropolis of Turangi, and it's lovely to see you all. Morena Tatana, Rachel Dewar from Wellington. It's a beautiful day here. Thank you, Rachel and Denise. Um, Rachel and Denise um, are both family lawyers based in Wellington, as they would have shared with you. Um, and they're also FDR mediators with many years of experience. Um, and I, like all of you, are really looking forward to learning from you both this morning. Um, and thank you for joining us today. We really appreciate your time. So moving on. Our topic today is assisting parties to develop a child-focused financial plan. And before I hand over to Rachel and Denise, I just wanted to remind everybody that there is the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Um, so please feel free to put forward your questions as we go along. And in fact, we actually have already received a question um, from one of our participants which might be a good way for us to start this morning. And that is how much time do you give parties to talk about financial issues in the mediation? So if I could hand over to Rachel and Denise to share with us. Would you like to start with that one, Denise? Well, um, I think today is actually hopefully an, a reminder for all us as mediators that conflict comes in many different languages. And so a conversation that's about financial matters is still a conversation about conflict. And um, so we should just give it as much time as, as it needs. In fact, I'd say all our mediations probably need at least some attention to financial matters uh, because separation does mean a whole lot of different needs that are sharing sometimes with the, what can be quite scarce resources. Mm -hmm. And I, I must admit, I find uh, that I resist talking about the nuts and bolts of financial issues with um, mediation participants because I feel that that's something that they should um, take responsibility for themselves. But I think there's some really interesting conversations to be had in mediation um, that don't talk about you know, the, uh, the amount of child support or the amount that should be paid from one parent to the other for their children, but about how they can ensure that all the costs for children are met equitably. That's the sort of conversation I think we as mediators can really usefully have by questioning uh, participants um, at mediation. Absolutely. And I know, Rachel, you've got a great story um, to share with everyone about that. But just, just in terms of thinking around uh, when parties come to mediation, I've heard some mediators go, oh, this is just a dispute that's really about child support because they want one more day to change the child support allocation. But um, I think we need to ask much more deeply, much questions much more fully around well, what does actually that mean? Because sometimes that is actually a conversation about people just simply not having enough money. And often you know, it's hard to share, especially when they want to, um, the conflict is at such a high level that mum's house is where mum has her clothes, dad's house is where dad has his clothes. I mean, some of our children, the ridiculous thing is parents spend money on a bike in each house, which might make sense if it's a transport issue, but if it's around unwillingness to share, um, that creates problems and it creates problems for children, especially where there is economic disparity between mm -hmm. the families. That's right. And I think, um, you know, it's the old saying that you just simply can't run two households as cheaply as one. And the sooner people get their heads around that, and, and as mediators, perhaps we can challenge 
um, participants to really say, well, you know, there's only so much money here and we still have hopes and dreams for our children. What are those hopes and dreams? You know, do we want our children to be um, horse riding, doing ballet, playing soccer, as they were when we were together? Um, and, and if we do, then how do we, how do we make that happen? You know, the resources are going to be stretched, particularly now with COVID. You know, there must be more families in financial distress at the moment than perhaps ever before. So we need to encourage participants and challenge them really to think smarter about how they, they um, make those financial decisions for their children. So let's go on to the next slide. And I think, Rachel, you were going to share, Denise mentioned you had something that you were going to share with us. Yeah, I had a client who um, told me about a situation she experienced some years ago where um, the, her ex-husband hadn't um, been um, paying voluntarily uh, as expected towards the children's costs. So she, in the end, went to IRD and had a formula assessment. And as a result, the, um, the husband was extremely angry, so much so that he spoke to the children about what a terrible thing their mother had done to him and that he was probably going to lose his house, that they would have to get rid of the family dog <coughs> and various other consequences that were deeply distressing to the children to hear. And, uh, and my client came back to me and, and said, uh, you know, that the, the, the children came back were very, very angry with her and blamed her for what they saw as this enormous crisis that she had brought about in their father's household. So um, this particular client thought about it and um, thought, now, what can I do about this? So um, she decided to sit down with the, the eldest child who was at that stage about 13, 14 and um, talked about what it actually cost to um, feed, clothe, house, uh, educate um, him and his siblings and to pay for all the extra activities that they were involved in. And then did a little bit of you know, research about, well, what did mum earn? What did dad earn? I think they Googled, uh, she said they Googled what dad was likely to be earning. She wasn't exactly sure. And just had a conversation with that um, uh, child about the facts really, about what it cost um, for things and the fairness about, you know, the, and the responsibility of, of them having two parents who were responsible, not only for their care, but also to meet their needs financially. And at the end of that, um, uh, she said that the, the son um, got it. He, he understood, he could see the reality. Um, and that was a way of her not blaming, not going back with blaming the husband and turning it into an almighty conflict, but actually involving um, uh, that older child in becoming a little bit financially literate and understanding um, the responsibilities of both of his parents to uh, meet the costs for him and his siblings. Hmm. Thank you. <clears throat> I think that's um, it's a great story, Rachel, because what it actually shows is that collaboration that we can encourage families to do and involving children and understanding the financial realities also helps them understand all their debt. So it's real capacity building for everybody, isn't it? And many, in fact, I can't think of many of uh, the mediations that I've done uh, are not about some sort of money thing because, you know, whether it's the number of days and that means child support conversations or whether it's, um, I remember way back in the early days of, of family mediation, we had a great story about the tooth fairy where at dad's house there was five dollars going under the pillow and mum's house there was one dollar going under the pillow. Child was storing up teeth to make sure they fell out at dad's house and um, mum was very distressed because mum wasn't sharing in the tooth fairy experience. 
by getting those parents to get together and talk about that subject, it actually led them to understand the difference around economic disparity. And there was no intention on the part of the father to try and dish the mother or make things less, you know, more pleasant at his mm. house. It, he wasn't even in that game. The, um, the issue was that there was just a lack of understanding of how poor the mother's circumstances were because dad's view was he was paying a massive amount of child support, but mum was on a benefit, so she wasn't actually getting any of that. So the kids being able to understand, and you know, I've often actively encouraged parents to use FDR as a planning, planning for extracurricular, planning for budgeting, and, um, and as you said, just making sure that children aren't used as either the financial managers or translators that because yeah. that is often what happens is that the children carry the messages about, well, ask your father for that or ask mm. your mother because I don't have the money. And so there's just this is why I think this conversation is so important. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Definitely, thank you. And if we go on to our next slide, I think what, what you both were talking about in terms of the responsibility of the parents um, around this issue is set out here. And I think it's really um, helpful in mediation just to um, make sure that parents understand uh, that when um, they're thinking about uh, their rights, um, that actually the, the um, Care of Children Act is talking about the rights of the child, not the rights of the parent, <coughs> and the responsibilities of the parents mm -hmm. to care for those children and to provide for them in the way that they would have done when they were together. And sometimes I think that really gets lost sight of and it's all about, you know, me and my problems and my issues. But by reframing um, that and reminding parents that it's, um, it's the responsibility of them, no one else, to financially provide for their children and make good decisions so that children get to do some of the activities that they want to do and... Um, and, and live in a way that both parents are comfortable with in both households, I think that's really important. Mm. And it also, I think, <coughs> emphasise that they don't have to do it alone, that they, they have the legal responsibility, but they are also quite clearly aimed at involving other family members. And often with financial difficulties or you know, challenges for um, caring for children, you can actually have the circumstance where um, for example, some cases, children aren't allowed to see a grandparent, and that's really about a parent issue. And in fact, the children going to see the grandparent and having lunch and being fed and cared for can actually be part of a financial solution, can't it, Rachel? Absolutely. And I, that reminds me, Denise, of a, a mediation where um, the mother, I think it was, was wanting to go back to work, but it immediately gave made a, a, an issue for her because she couldn't afford to pay for before and after school uh, after school care. And um, by exploring with the parents um, what other resources were available, how they could manage that, it transpired that there were two grandmothers who were desperate to spend time with these children. And just as you said, Denise, um, these parents actually got quite excited and there was a phone call made and they were able to come back to the mediation and confirm that one grandmother was more than happy to uh, come over in the morning, make sure the children were uh, had breakfast, were, got ready for school and off to school. And the other grandparent was more than happy several days a week to uh, pick them up and take them home um, and give them dinner so that that really took uh, a huge financial burden away from um, both parents and also provided some really quality care for the children that hadn't been happening since separation. So, you know, that, that was sort of a, 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 an amazing outcome mm. for the children, a win-win. And, and the beauty of that is, of course, that with the people that we mediate, chances are they've never had good conversations around money. I mean, it's astounding how often 
relationships are stressed and break up over money. And usually it's the lack of money. So um, these are hard topics that people have themselves struggled with in the relationship. And we shouldn't expect that it's going to be easier if they're out of it. Encourage financial conversation as an opportunity to maximize the resources available to the family in the biggest way possible. It happens when we are brave enough to start using the sort of dangerous questions that mm. our absolute fabulous Ken Cloak gives us in his Mediating Dangerously book, which we happen to have a copy of. <laughs> I highly recommend that um, you all rush out and purchase Ken Cloak's um, Mediating Dangerously book. It is just um, amazing and uh, you can dip in and out of it, but it just really inspires and refreshes uh, me when perhaps I'm feeling a bit, um, uh, you know, oh gosh, this is, this is getting hard. Uh, running out of ideas, or if I haven't done a mediation for a wee while. So, yeah, I really <coughs> encourage people to um, have a look at that and um, use some of Ken's uh, ideas to really ask those brave questions and remembering, you know, we've got to ask, not tell. I think that's so important to mm. um, remember as a mediator. We're just questioning, questioning the whole time and trying to uncover what's going on for parents because we can make all sorts of assumptions and most of the time we'll be wrong um, by, by listening to, you know, the initial positions that people put forward. But if we keep questioning and be brave and maybe put out, uh, throw out um, ideas for them to explore, um, you know, we'll get a lot further and it'll be a lot more satisfactory for the, uh, for the parents. Yeah, and I think that extends to, <coughs> to um, you know, I think it's a great, great uh, planning or training moment for us all. Is actually, I find it really useful to ask quite brave questions like, do you really think that he doesn't want to feed the children? Or do you really think that she doesn't want to do anything with the kids? Why would she not want to do that? Or why doesn't she take the kids out? And those sorts of questions actually often come down to a lack of money. Mm. And it's and, mm. it, and if you ask them in the big fat open way in the mediation, then you know, I, I, I will say to people, hmm, that sounds pretty miserable for the kids. What, why do you not be able to take them anywhere? And, and it comes down to money often. The other thing I... Um find is if you have a parent who is absolutely resistant to sharing care, you know, they just simply won't contemplate another day um, with the other parent. And I, I often try and explore, you know, well, you have to explore why is that? And, you know, when it comes down to it, the, the reason often is that it will alter their, their fear really of their child support arrangements, um, financial arrangements changing. And they, they absolutely attribute uh, to the other parent uh, a motivation to have the children so that they don't have to pay child support or that they pay less. And once you <coughs> uncover that, then you can actually work with it. You know, you can then, having discovered it, um, you know, say to them, well, if that's your main fear, your main worry, it's not that, you know, the other parent's hopeless or, or can't parent or has had no experience or whatever, um, then you can start to say, well, uh, you know, what about if, you know, what if the other parent uh, had an extra day with the children but carried on paying the same child support to you, you know, on a voluntary basis? Mm -hmm. Would that fix the, the, the problem for you. And, you know, it's really telling if someone says no. Yeah. If they say yes, then you can say, great, why don't you have that discussion? Mm. And then this will be sorted. If they say no, then you've got to dig deeper because obviously there's something else going on that you still haven't uncovered that you need to know in order to move people forward as to why they resist um, the childcare arrangements that are on the table for discussion. And I think that 
You've got to be, that's where the initial meetings with the parties are so important too. Because you need to understand, um, you know, just exactly what the impact of a loss of that amount of money could be. So in one case that I had, it actually would have meant mum couldn't afford it to stay in the rental house that she was in. And so by saying to dad, hmm, do you want the kids to move house? It's like, what's that got to do with it? Mm -hmm. Got everything to do with it because the money is the issue. And then the other side of that coin is, you know, I've had fathers who, um, when it's been put to them, you know, if if you got an extra day with your children but still had to pay the same child support, would you do it? And they've said, of course. You know, yeah. I can afford to do that. That, that. It's more important to me that I get time with my children. And, and of course, you know, if there's a need for that support, I, I'll do it. Yeah. So yeah. you unlock all that potential, don't you, by understanding what is behind people's resistance. Yeah. And also, mm. it's amazing to me how, um, how infrequently the people are unaware of how they could maximize the resources available. Like, for example, um, a parent might want to have a child in daycare when the other parent is perfectly available to care for the child. But because they think that means they're not taking the responsibility, they won't do it. So they'd rather be financially impoverished by using daycare when in actual fact, there is a, a much less now, much less expensive option available if they would just stop seeing children as being chopped into days. If mum and dad can cooperate, the pie is bigger. Mm. And, and the other thing I think that we must all see as mediators is that the dynamic that existed when they were together, um, some of those characteristics will continue and sometimes it's useful to ask them to think back to, well, how did you do this stuff? How did you make financial decisions? How did you arrange things when you were together? That can be really useful to then see if you can carry that forward to the mm -hmm. post-separation world. But other times being separated opens up a whole new range of possibilities uh, and ways of doing things and ways of collaborating and thinking about how to meet children's needs. And you can really capitalize on that, I think, by, by it, trying to um, encourage parents to see it as a, as a, 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 a growth possibility, um, you know, a new chance to do things differently to, and, you know, perhaps a parent who hasn't taken much financial responsibility during the relationship, you know, now that, now they are, now they understand, and now they are wanting to actively participate in that role, whereas perhaps they never did in the relationship, or maybe someone was very financially controlling in the relationship. And they have to think about um, changing that now that they're separated and respecting the other parent's um, financial literacy and encouraging it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. So encouraging parents to engage in those or having those difficult conversations is something that we as mediators need to be um, moving towards with or become comfortable with. Do you have any advice specifically around that for our mediators? I know you spoke a little bit about the dangerous questions for Ken Cloak, but um, you know, is there any is there any advice around how we can empower parents to really have conversations, especially when they don't want to or they're finding it really challenging? I think the main thing for me is that we must always remember that our job is we are the mediators. Mm. And it's really challenging and we must meet the challenge of not taking responsibility for the outcome. Mm. To me, that's all around preparation. So um, when, when it comes to an individual meeting, uh, that's where we need to be asking questions of people, helping them prepare for the mediation by making them feel brave enough 
mm. to know that when we're going to ask them a particular question, that they're going to have their opportunity. And that whole concept of coaching, helping people have those tricky, those are the things that I will often encourage um, people to talk about with the preparation for mediation as well. It's like, mm. we always struggle to talk about money in the family because whatever, whatever. But it's, it's actually vital that you do this. Now you're in a business, you, you, you are running a business. The product of the business is bringing up the best children you can bring up. So you have to behave in a business-like manner. You need mm. budgets, you need plans, you need to financially report. Mm. It's actually not that hard, but it's all in the preparation. And yeah. that's, okay. from, well, that's my opinion. Rachel, I'm sure mm. you Yeah, I, I absolutely would agree with that. And the other thing I've been um, doing for the last few years, which um, tends to make my job a little bit easier, is when you have those individual conversations, I I really encourage parents to actually not wait for the joint session, because sometimes that's a week or more away. Um, and sometimes there's quite a gap because, you know, it gets put off. And I say to people, look, you know, if you need to know this information from the other parent, or if you have information to share, uh, or ideas to share, why not do it now, you know, and, and we talk a little bit about how they could do that, um, and and then just, you know, really encourage them to um, get on with it, really, mm -hmm. they, you know, individually, so that by the time they get to the joint session, I'm always thrilled to discover that things that I've raised with each of them, they, they have communicated, mm -hmm. They've started the, pro you know, the process of mediation doesn't start and stop at the joint, you know, beginning and end of the joint session. It starts immediately, you ring them or you email them and carries on. And, the, and in the same way, you know, if there are things still to be um, set up, like that you, they might have agreed at mediation to set up a shared um, spreadsheet of children's expenses. Uh, and they might have decided to meet for coffee, um, you know, once a month to go over um, what's happening or once a term to talk about extracurricular activities and who's going to do what and who's going to pay for what. But those sort of things you're encouraging them after the joint session to carry on with, to implement, to tweak, to um, develop in a way that's uniquely theirs. So, so it's one long continuous process, it seems to me, rather than everyone going, well, the mediator's responsible on a particular day, you know, when you've only got three hours, say, uh, to solve all of these enormous problems. And I think that's where mediators get really bogged down and we can be smarter about that. It's really encourage and empower people to do a lot of that homework and, and what Denise is saying, preparation, as if you were running a business. Uh, you don't go into a meeting with none of your facts and figures uh, for a business meeting. So in the same way, people should do that work in advance uh, with each other and themselves, and then be prepared to carry on the work uh, with each other afterwards. I think that's the key, is um, in terms of what a mediated outcome looks like, it's the commitment to future action. I had the privilege of reading a lot of mediated agreements. <clears throat> really days, it was like, we'll return to FDR. Well, that's a fail in my opinion. <laughs> if they actually have keeps parenting to go, they have to do this themselves, they've got to have a process to do it themselves, and I just want to mention the, um, oops, suddenly we are parents together mediations, because um, that is all around instructing people, <clears throat> because they had no intention that night when they were out having fun, to have to become shared financial capability. Yeah. Move to our next Next slide, yes, thank you. Yeah, so we've talked about, I think we've talked a lot about some of this stuff, but um, it is about being practical. I think that's that's the key, isn't it? It's, mm. it's, it's not, um, I always, I find it quite helpful to actually fully understand as a mediator how child support works and to have it available as a quick link on my um, on my computer so that we can actually have the conversation and how it makes a difference. 
But actually, and then I say, well, none of this actually meets all the needs of the children, does it? Because no one can raise a child <coughs> 26 a week. Yeah, and that's our education um, role. It, it's not a huge role in mediation, but it's there, I think, to really get people to stop and consider, you know, if they're paying through IRD, you know, really, is that is that meeting our children's needs? Because if they really think about it, um, they'll realise that it is not going to cover anything more than the basics. And it shouldn't be um, a source of resentment and, well, I pay, you know, so much mm. and therefore I, don't, I shouldn't have to pay a penny more. Um, it should be about, well, that, well, that's a contribution, my contribution to the basics for my children. And actually, look, there are all these other costs. And, you know, uh, parents generally um, really want their children to uh, engage in extracurricular activities, be able to go away to school camps, all those things that can be a huge financial burden um, if, if children are, are living um, more with one parent and that parent ends up sort of having to pay for those things um, and the other parent is really getting off scot-free and that wouldn't be the case if they were together. They would be sharing that and, and their children would know and should know um, that both parents are supporting them in those activities. So it's about really <clears throat> a little bit of education and then encouraging people to then talk about what those things are they want their kids to do and, and really how can they make it happen and be and innovative I, about it. And I also think that it's quite, um, you know, possibly I get to see quite a lot of poverty in the mediations that I'm doing. And um, so part of that is how can you feel better about asking for support? Because, um, you know, all, all parents want the best for their children mm -hmm. and, and it's a matter of finding. So actually a financial conversation around financial arrangements for the care of children is, well, can you jointly approach some of the agencies that are available to support? Mm -hmm. if, if mum, you're entitled to two food, food benefits, and the kids are going to dad's for the school holidays. He doesn't have an entitlement. Is it possible you could share your entitlement? That sort of stuff. Yeah. These, these mm -hmm. things really got to be huge reality testing mm -hmm. um, and recognition that you know we do have high levels of poverty and we do have high levels of financial stress because some families are so busy keeping up with the neighbours that they've put themselves into a heck of a mess. <clears throat> yeah. You're right, because I remember um, doing um, one mediation where there was going to be a lot of travel for the children uh, in order, because one parent um, was relocating, and actually it was really, it was mainly about relocation, and um, the parents came up with a really neat plan about how they were going to, the, the, to allow the parent who wanted to relocate to, to make that happen. Um, and there's a lot of goodwill in the room. But when we got to the reality testing about it, there was a really uncomfortable bit because the parent who'd volunteered to do most of the driving of the children uh, to see the parent who was relocating, um, you know, was starting to get uncomfortable. And it turned out that that, you know, it was the financial aspect of that. It wasn't the time I, I was thinking oh, it's the time factor, but it wasn't that. This parent was prepared to drive for several hours on a semi-regular basis um, so that children would see both parents, but actually it was the cost. And of course, that hadn't been factored in. And so then we had to have a, a discussion about how that could be shared and um, you know whether they needed to, in fact, think about meeting maybe somewhere in the middle sometimes, not, not always one parent mm. doing all that travel and bearing the cost. And they actually very amicably, as they had already come to an agreement about how they could make this work um, for, for themselves and the children, they actually came up with um, how to cover that cost. Um, and so that the plan, if you like, stuck. But if we hadn't done that, but I suspect it would have fallen over quite quickly because mm. resentment would have built up and it would have just become <clears throat> such a burden 
um, then it wouldn't have it wouldn't have uh, lasted. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and the, the idea of um, you know keeping up with the neighbours is is one aspect, but what about parents trying to keep up with each other? You know, when there is that economic disparity between the two homes, and um, and one parent is perhaps you know feeling um, that the children might you know prefer to be with the other parent because they can do more at dad's house or they can do more fun activities at mum's house. So, and how how would you how would you discuss that with parents? Well, it comes back to it comes back to the language, and it, it, mm. if we see money as a language, um, then for uh, for example, one of the things I'm involved with at the moment is mum is desperate to have more care of the children, mm. and so she promises to buy things and take them shopping and do things, and when she can't deliver, then that's uh, the child gets very upset and and doesn't want anything to do with the mother. And there's two things going on in that respect. One is obviously mum's own circumstances, but the other thing is to the father's credit in this case, he actually does not use that, which he could. He could go, there you go, she's hopeless and she's financially mm. and all the rest of it, which would actually just create conflict. Um, and he is trying to work with the mother to try and make her not promise, which is a mm. really thing that he wants the children to have a relationship with their mum and he would like to help her not promise now mm. that that's a language because underneath all that is she thinks he's controlling and that he's told her what to do through the whole so what the point of that is we just need to see all these things as just language it's just mm. the language of conflict played out with different topics yeah. and, and so you know, calling behavior, I think, that in a, in a nice way, in a questioning way that goes, well, you know, how does that work for the kids if they're doing this mm. and doing that? You, you get really good quality conversations from parents. Mm. Mm. Yeah, because that overcompensating um, by parents after separation is, is very common and, uh, and probably once you begin that behavior, it's hard to stop. Um, so it's great to point that out, you know, just to sort of draw attention to it for parents so that they can rethink that. Um, but also the other thing I see a lot of is, um, you know, one parent who can afford it is buying a lot of devices um, or, you know, tech toys for mm. children. And then uh, those, those things stay in that parent's home and then the children go back to the other parent who doesn't have all of that and can't afford it. And the children then sort of complain. Um, And you get into this tug of war about, you know, whether a child can take a device between households um, or not. And and I think that's that's so sad. It's it's the modern equivalent of clothes, you know, (laughs) children not being able to, um, you know, travel with clothes and and other, you know, um, toy bunnies and things when they're little. And I think I think parents really need to pay attention to um, how they are going to uh, resolve that conflict because it, it creates enormous conflict, as we know. Um, and and it seems to me that um, you know if one parent can't afford um, a, a laptop for a child uh, for schoolwork or a, some other device that there needs to be a conversation if the other parent is able to help or is able to provide that. And thinking about, you know, these things, you know, what is the ownership? You know, is it something for the child? In which case, if it's the child's, shouldn't it travel with the child? Having those conversations and opening people's um, uh, eyes up to the, the, the real conflict that can happen between children and parents and between each parent, it's just not worth it. I mean, do people really want to spend their lives arguing about this stuff? And I think that's right. And, and having parents with a united ability to say no to children is also a really important part of fun. Um, because, you know, there are children who 
uh, very smart and who go, mum and dad are in conflict over money. This is my perfect opportunity to get what I don't need, but what I want. And um, so United Parenting, um, mm -hmm. as mediators, I think our job is to just encourage that open collaboration and I always think it's useful to remind the parents that they're actually going to be needing to do open collaboration on financial matters for the rest of their lives because there will be, there'll be grandparents together and so there will be issues about presents for grandchildren and mm. all those things. So it is a put the energy in and the effort in the mediations that we're doing. Yeah. So I've just changed the slide, but I think we've spoken about most of... Most of those points. I think the only point I'd like to um, is that um, an administrative or an application for administrative review in itself is a conflict conversation. Mm. Because, um, you know, you would often hear people that the anger that comes out of that administrative review process is really because people are having to bear their souls to the IRD. So, um, if there was a way to encourage people to, you know, if you if the person is believing that they're not properly putting forward their income because they've got a business and they can arrange it, hmm. then, then actually shifting the conversation to, well, how are you going to meet the financial needs of the children is actually a way of shifting that admin hmm. review. Because most people find, I think, that admin reviews are not particularly helpful and they only last for a year and you get the constantly hmm. on a cycle of admin reviews. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd agree, Denise. I often hear, oh, we can't make decisions about that because we're going through an admin review. And of course, it takes time. It, it means that parents are stuck. And then when they get the result, at least one person's very, very unhappy. Uh, maybe both are unhappy. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, then you've got a lot of ground to try and make up to get people back into a, into a headspace where they can actually, you know, stop resenting each other um, about over money mm. and instead, um, you know, have more constructive conversations. They won't be easy conversations, but, um, you know, actually really focus on what's important. Um, and I think us as mediators, by challenging people to really think about that stuff um, you know that's doing our job that's helping people to at least have a chance to get off that track of of um, resentment and um, conflict and think about doing things differently yeah and that's why I absolutely love the whole idea of encouraging parents to develop their annual financial plan because um, it's it, so, you know, it's, it's almost like you can say, well, tell us about your children and what do they do and, and, and all of that. And the next question is, and how do you pay for it all? And yeah. how does it all work? So to, get, to answer the question that was asked at the beginning of the seminar, how much time do you give your life? A lot. In mm -hmm. It's a code that can be cracked and used as a conflict conversation. Mm. And I think it's, you know, because I have this head... Um, mindset that I don't want to get into the nitty gritty of financial stuff in mediation. I think it's easy to um, not realize that we actually need to have those conversations and that we actually are having them anyway, but just we're just reframing it slightly. We're, we're talking about it in that broader way and in, in, in our reality testing. Um, so it doesn't have to be, you know, the first thing you talk about necessarily, but it's got to be part of that conversation with our, our, um, our parents. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Thank you. I'm just going to move the slides along, but I think, I think we've already discussed this one as well as we've gone through it. We haven't been very good for you, have we, Samantha? We've been <laughs> this has been wonderful. I think it's been so um, so useful to to really focus on the fact that you know that money is a code, that it 
it's part of all different aspects of the mediation conversation that's happening between the parties. Um, and that there's a lot of fear and, and resentment that parents bring in when they talk about money. And that, you know, not everybody or many of us aren't good at having conversations about money. And when we add in the complexity of having to negotiate with someone that we'd rather not be negotiating with, um, especially if we're coming from the place of feeling that we've got less to offer, less resources to offer, it can make that conversation really difficult. And I suppose our natural inclination is to avoid difficult conversations. And as mediators, we need to be empowering our parties to actually have those conversations. And I really like the idea of, um, you know, always starting that preparation way before the joint meeting. It's so important to get people into that headspace of thinking about, you know, what homework and research and information do they need to be able to have meaningful conversations um, at mediation. And I, yeah, it was really, really enjoyable. Thank you. Thank you, both of you. It was good. <laughs> it was good to to learn um, to learn more about it. It's <clears throat> one of the things that I'm noticing in my practice at the moment is that the issue of money, and not well, not the issue of money, the fear, the fear around money, um, and not having resources for the children, um, is something that um, is becoming stronger. Um, and I think that it's a, a lot of it is to do with COVID. You know, a lot of parents have been directly financially impacted, but a lot of parents are worried about what the possible consequences could be when making long-term um, agreements in their in their mediation agreements. Yeah, have you have either of you noticed anything around that? Um, I, I don't. I think it's always been difficult. Um, I. But I, what I would like people to leave from this webinar is that's our job. As mediators, we do best when we understand that people are possibly fearful about having conversations. But mm. that actually just simply, that whole managing power and balances, um, ensuring that people are capable and, and you know, in a space to participate, and that's all around knowledge and empowerment mm. and hearing. So it's just actually good mediator skills to, to um, encourage these conversations. And I suppose the thing would be, if we're worried about having those conversations ourselves, then we need to do some more training and development. Mm, mm. And braver mediators, I would say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'd agree with that, Denise. And I think you've said what I was thinking of, that the financial stuff is just part often of the power imbalance between parties mm. that they bring to the mediation table. And sometimes that's about, um, as mediators, thinking, well, you know, yes, there's a financial contribution aspect, but there's also lots of other things that parents bring uh, to their children's lives. And you know, some parents can give time. Other mm. parents can support financially, you know, and that's a very black and white way of looking at it. But it's, it's um, you know, often there's other contributions that parents can make in order to even up that power imbalance or that perceived imbalance mm. of power. Mm. Um, and it's about exploring that in a really um, open way, as Denise has said, um, and encouraging people not to see it in a very rigid, um, yeah, a, a very mm. narrow way. Yes. It's a great, great question, um, which has just come in. If I can just jump in. To... Mm. It's, it's a, the question goes something like, what if one parent is, one parent's angry because the other parent's choosing to, to work part-time? And that's, you know, that's such an awesome question because each parent's right to tell the other parent what to do has completely disappeared. If one parent chooses to work part-time, um, that's the parent's choice. And sometimes it's the same bewildering fact that a person has the right to make their own decisions that has been part of the problem in the relationship. And so what, I, what I'm thinking we would need to do in those circumstances is recognize the non-financial contribution 
person mm -hmm. who works part-time makes to the family. I think that's the point you're making, Rachel, as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is that when we're talking about financial contributions, uh, we should equally value the non-paid financial. Mm -hmm. And, and it, whatever the conflict language that people are choosing to use, the bottom line is it goes back to that joint equal responsibility to collaborate. That's, that's where it starts and ends. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Is that that um, responsibility to sort out the issues and make a plan that works for the children um, is that that is the parents' role at the mediation, and so as mediators, helping our parents to get to a place where they can do that and take on that responsibility is um, you know is so is so important, and all of that preparation and thinking to get them there is you know. That's our role, but ultimately the plan is is theirs. Hmm. Okay. Do we have any any more questions? Just having a look down here. While you're having a look at that, there's one other thing that I um, quite often use that people seem to relate to in a mediation, and that's to take people back to their school days and say, do you remember learning about Venn diagrams? I often get a bit mm. of a blank look, but then I sort of demonstrate it uh, maybe up on the whiteboard or with just with my hands. And I say, well, just imagine, you know, this is your household and this is your ex's household and there's those two circles and you don't mm. want the child to have to be, you know, walking between the two. But if you just sort of bring them together and think about a Venn diagram, and imagine your child being in that sweet spot in the middle where there is some sharing of resources, mm -hmm. some sharing of care, uh, and they move easily from one household to the other. And you can see people actually, go, oh, you know, and they, it's, it's a sort of an image that I think it's easy for people to remember. So happy for any of you out there to use that yourselves mm -hmm. um, because it just seems to connect with people in a, in a sort of fairly basic level. I like that. Thank you, Rachel. That's, <clears throat> that's good to remember, creating that, um, that, that zone where, the, where their child can be in, well, it, it's being held by both parents, isn't it? Both parents are holding that space and keeping that space positive um, and Forward focused, but but also it's it's the space where where their child should be living, yeah, it's, rather than in these two separate places. Hmm. And I think that's um you know this is where I think we have a lot to learn because the models of mediation that we are currently familiar with are hmm. very Eurocentric. They're very about two parents. Hmm. In Aotearoa, New Zealand, a lot of our families don't live like that. And so yeah. I love your Venn, I love your Venn diagrams. And mm. It shows that we're the similar age, Rachel, that we know what they are. But I think <laughs> there's, a, yeah, uh, there's a bigger bubble where mm. they're rich with resources, which was yeah. which, rich with opportunity. When we add in um, Fano, hapu, mm. and we start really looking, and whether that's for our Pacifica or our European children, the reality is that families have resources all over the place that relate to the people who support the parents. And, mm. but, you know, when you're struggling in, in a mediation and you're asking what else can you do, I think there's a question that I've started using which I'm finding is fantastic. And that is, where else can you get your support? Who else mm. What else is possible? So um, your Venn diagram just needs to have a golden burst behind it, which is <laughs> the people who can support the mm. Yeah. Um, you've just made me think as you're talking, maybe we need to develop a, um, you know, a kite, a, a holding, a bag, a basket of resources, image for people. Um, and yes, we can throw out the Venn diagram and if that's old hat and, and think about, you know, what's culturally appropriate? How can we 
we we recognise all the results resources that can go into that kite uh, and and hold that child and those those families um, safely, securely, um, and and financially soundly. That's why. I, that's why. I my um, my uh, kōrero this morning with my toki about your basket and my basket, everyone will be fed, and I think that's mm -hmm. really what we're talking about here. Yeah, yes. absolutely, absolutely. Mm. And I see that in uh, one of the people who have just um, made a comment is saying it's just like the old saying: it takes a village to raise a child. Exactly, it's what we're talking yes. about. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. And um, and I think both of you touched on this earlier that that often in when separation happens and the parents separate, um, you know perhaps mum's you know perhaps mum's mum was quite instrumental in providing care during the week when the child was at school after school care, and suddenly when when dad has has the daughter he you know he doesn't feel able to use that that resource and so talking about you know what did they used to do and what are they doing now and what and what is still possible and and you know it 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 might just be the um the ability to have the conversation and to realize that actually you know mum's mum doesn't really care who whose day it is? She just wants to spend time with her grandchild, you know. And she she's really missing that um, that routine and um, that relationship that she was building. So yeah, this is that idea of holding the space and who else is in the space and important for that child, and um, and adds adds value for the family and and adds um, to that to that resource basket is really important. Hmm. And, and the harsh reality is that when people celebrate, uh, uh, sorry, separate, you know, often people who have worked part time or maybe not been working mm. for a number of years, they're forced to go back to work in yeah. order to survive, and and that brings all those consequences for children that parents are not available to them in the way that they were previously. So then you really have to think outside the square about. You know, are there aunties and uncles and um, grandparents um, who can be, you know, brought closer in to mm -hmm. the parenting for that child and to support the parents in really practical ways mm -hmm. um, so that there is enough money to go around? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you both so much for your time today. It's been wonderful um, spending this hour with you. And um, thank you also to Denise, who's um, shared a paper that she wrote on this topic with us, which we'll be sending out to the panelists um, in the next few days. Thank you, Denise. We really appreciate those additional thoughts that you have put together for us. It's a great read. So I'd really recommend all the panelists to go through that. Um, and, and of course, um, Ken Cloak's book um, and his Dangerous Questions is another great resource for all of us to remember to use when we're trying to, um, you know, trying to start these conversations um, and encourage parents to take on this res the responsibility for making these really important decisions for their children. Thank you both so much. I hope you all enjoy the rest of your day. Um, and Denise and, you, and Rachel, yes. Thank you thank very you. much, Samantha. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Mahinui kia koto katoa, kia pai tora. Thank you. Kia ora. Thank you.